I was um, just wanted to share something with you. I, I was away in a, a regional um, day, so so every now and again, maybe maybe three or four times a year, all the pastors in the in the region um, get together and, and some teaching and various things like that. And I was away at Exeter on Friday, and our, our new general superintendent Mark Pugh was. Uh, just imparting something of his vision um, for Elim, for the movement over the, over the coming months and years. And what Mark's done is rather than, rather than set out a sort of vision plan, you know, that he can show on a, on a PowerPoint presentation or something like that, what he's done is first act as the new general superintendent of Elim churches is to call the movement to a move of consecration. And that's really struck me as something which is um, not, not just meaningful because it sounds good, but something which uh, it is for us as individuals, for us as a movement, it's for us as an individual church, but it's also for us personally. And so I've been thinking about this consecration, about how we give ourselves over to God, and I've been thinking over the last couple of days about how we handle the presence of God. What's our expectation when we come to church? Why do we come to church? What is our reason in being here? Are we here today because this is what we do on a Sunday? Are we here today because we like the worship, we like to hear the preacher, we like to, to do those things and maybe we get our spiritual fix, we get our are shot in the arm, so to speak, that takes us through the week? Or are we here to encounter the physical and real presence of a living God? Are we here to come to a place of consecration in our own hearts before Him? You know, I always like to start our services with a, a, a word from Scripture, and usually I, I find something which I I was encouraging to say, oh, praise the Lord, for the, the loud symbol or something like that. But I want to share a couple of verses with you from 1 Chronicles 13. It's a story of uh, Uzzah. It says they moved the ark. That's the ark of the covenant, the uh, physical manifestation or the physical representation of the presence of God at that time. They moved the ark of God from Abinadab's house on a new cart with Uzzah and Ahio guiding him. And David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God with songs and harps and lyres and tambourines and cymbals and trumpets. And I could leave that there. Isn't it great to praise God? And then this is where they were in a place of praise, in a place of worship before God. His presence was there with his people manifesting that ark at the time and that was amazing. But then it says, when they came to the threshing floor of Kedon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark because the oxen stumbled. And the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah and he struck him down because he put his hand on the ark. And so he died there before God. That's a bit harsh, isn't it? He died. Why? Did that happen? And I've been mulling over this and, and thinking over it and praying over it. Do you know what it is? Uzzah, Uzzah felt that he had to help God out. God had been very, very, very down the line with this. Don't touch the ark. God's got it. It doesn't matter what it looks like. The ox and stumbles. God's got it. God could send down angels from heaven to bear the ark up and float it to where it needed to be if he needed to. He could teleport it there if he needed to. But the thing is, it's not what physically happened to the ark. It's the fact that Uzzah felt that he had to help God out. He didn't know how to, he didn't know how to handle the presence of God. And he thought that he had to interject and he had to put some of his humanity into that to help God. And I've been guilty of the same thing. You know, I need to, I need to 
move the service in a particular way. I need, I need to encourage people by doing this. Hey, it actually just needs to be left to the presence of God. Would you stand with me? I want you to be a people who are expecting for the presence of God this morning. Not because I say it from the platform. Not because of the way that our musicians lead the music. But because each of us is here to connect with Him today. Because each of us is here to give ourselves 100% over to God. And let me tell you this today. If he is not 100% your focus this morning, if he is not 100% your reason for being here, your reason for getting up today, your reason for breathing, then I would pray that you'll come to that place of his presence and remove your own hand from that situation. And I need to pray the same over myself. Father, today, we pray for your presence. We pray for your manifest presence in this place. We pray, God, that you will move amongst us as we praise you. As David and all the people of Israel did as they were walking along, they were praising God. And they were making their noise. But Lord, today, would you simply show us who you are and remove our hand? Lord, let us take our hands off of your presence. And let us be who we need to be in front of you. In Jesus' name, Lord, amen. I'm just going to sing that song again that I just started. At the beginning of the week, it was really on my heart. And all through the week, I've just been singing it. So there's a reason for singing it this morning. I just want you to sing it as a prayer. You don't know it, just listen to the words. <coughs>
as we raise a hallelujah before you. Lord, would that be part of our act of consecration to you today? The consecration of our hearts, a laying open of ourselves of who we are, a laying open of all of our defenses that we put up before you, before people. Lord, would we come before you? Would we, in a sense, lay ourselves before you? Lord, would you renew in us a sense of the empowering of your Holy Spirit today? Would you remind us who we are unto you? Awaken your giftings in us again, Lord Jesus. Grow your fruit in our lives again, Lord Jesus. As we give ourselves over to you today, Lord, I pray, Father, for tongues, for interpretations, for words of wisdom and knowledge, for prophecies. I pray for the miraculous, Lord. I pray for healings. I pray, Lord, that all of those things will become, Lord, part of our everyday again. Lord, would you take us away from the mechanics of church and bring us to a place of openness before you. Lord, as we raise our hallelujah, would that be with pure hearts, with open hearts, with glad hearts, with hearts that are in upon you, upon your name, upon who you are, upon your blood to cleanse us from all of our sin and wrongdoing. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 In the darkness we
just want to uh, introduce again to you this morning uh, our two Morland students, uh, David and Ray. Come and come and join me, would you? Give them a clap. Give them a clap. Supervisor, and I love uh, investing in the lives of students. So I've just invited uh, Ray and David to come and share a little bit about themselves this morning, sort of where they're from, uh, what, what they're doing in college, and what their plans are for the future. So here you go. Thanks, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm David. Come. Um, yeah, uh, more shoot. I'm my second year on the first year of degree at Foundation Year last year. I'm on the youth track, so everything you quite honest today. Uh, a bit of background. Uh, my parents are missionaries. <laughs> uh, my parents were missionaries in Malawi, in a Blantai and a long way. Blantai and a long way. Um, which are the two major cities. Um, and they did a bunch of everything. I uh, came back to England, I school, and just been uh, got into cooking. And I became a chef in a Michelin star restaurant where I was a saucier. And then I eventually moved up to be in the suit in um, Mannheim Curve, which is now Cypress Sandbar and Centre Leeds, which is now just shut. So, I'm missing it. Yeah, I don't And, um, yeah, so I decided I'd more to the change of pace, a bit more direction in my life, because I was just going to work, going to bed, work, going to bed, going to work, going to bed. And decided I'm a bit too young to be doing that. <coughs> a bit more of a chance and got a bit of my heart youth work and community kitchens um, so I've got a lot of experience with the kitchen side and the business side um, so I thought I should get a degree in something that would help not just me um, that's why I'm here Hi, I'm Ray um, I'm doing the foundation year so that's like not starting the degree yet it's a bit before um, I'm also going to do the youth track and yeah, I guess I kind of had a crazy testimony and God put it on my heart uh, that I should go to Orleans and do something now that my life has completely changed. And yeah, I really like, really have a heart for youth and like seeing revival in youth because I think the enemy likes to attack younger generations to nip it in the bud. So yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> Thanks guys, so I'm going to ask Pastor Garrett to come and pray for these guys this morning. And uh, can we all just stand and um, pray for our students this morning? Tempted to welcome both the job. Um, <laughs> let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for um, hearts to follow you. And Lord, um, responding to a call to learn, to study, to engage with you, and to seek um, after that which you have on our hearts. In this case, young people, and community kitchens, Lord, um, two things that can be beautifully combined. And Lord, I just pray for a freshness of your spirit upon both of these. Um, as Lord, they, they step into studies, um, help their minds to cope with all the things they have to do for the essays and everything else that they have to do. But at the same time, Lord, fan a flame within them that seeks to reach the lost and to people. To show them your love, to show them your heart, to show them your presence, Lord. May they be Jesus everywhere they go, both in the college and outside. And whilst they're with us here, Lord, help us to serve them, to encourage them, to inspire them, and not to put on them the things that would hinder them, but Lord, to untangle them as much as we can and release them for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Uh, give her a clap again. Invite them for lunch, take them out for lunch, you know, either either separately or together, and uh, just get to know them as a church. It's my great pleasure now to introduce Rosa. We all know Rosa, but well, most of us know Rosa. Just put your hand up if you've never met Rosa. <laughs> Neil, I don't think you have. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so it's great to have Rosa here. Rosa is here today representing. 
freedom, which is such a fantastic course. So I'm just going to shut up now and hand over to you. Thanks, Rosa. It's been a year since I was here last time, and thank you, Sarah, Elaine, everybody, for having me back. Um, last year I shared, shared a bit of my testimony. This year I thought I'd give a bit of a background about A21, um, who created um, the Freedom. So, A21 is a global anti human trafficking organisation dedicated to abolishing slavery everywhere, forever. And a lot of people ask, what does the A stand for? Well, it's for abolitionists of the 21st century. A21 was started by Christine Kane. I don't know how many people may know that name yet. She's an evangelist, preacher, author, amazing woman. Um, there's lots of leadership series as well for women and young, young girls. Anyway, in 2007, after seeing posters of missing children in Greece and everyone just walking past and not taking any notice, she decided to inquire. And having seen a poster with a child of the same age of her child at that time, she was six, with the same name of her daughter, she felt she had to do something. So she started raising awareness, and by 2014, there were campaigns such as Bodies Are Not Commodities, that started in secondary schools in America, and today there is the Can You See Me campaign that you might find in airports, and also Walk for Freedom was started 10 years ago. While it's estimated that there are 50 million people enslaved across the globe, A21 continues to focus on the one, the one man, the one woman, and the one child trapped in slavery. The harrowing reality is that there are more people enslaved in the world today, one in four are children, than at any other point in human history, and it's happening in our communities too. Before I supported a survivor of human trafficking back in 2017, I was naive to think it didn't happen here in the UK. I thought our laws protected human rights, and that would prevent the slavery and the exploitation that is happening here. However, it's estimated that 122,000 people are living in modern slavery in the UK alone. And I don't know if you saw the news that McDonald's and a factory that was um, supplying foodstuffs to some of the largest supermarkets were found to have ignored um, employees' legitimate jobs. They were working all the hours of the day, nobody queried it, and yet their salaries were going into a gang master, they're called. Latest figures show 73% of potential victims identified in the UK are male, and 27% are female. The largest group to be referred to the NRM, which is the National Referral Mechanism that we use here in the UK to identify victims of slavery, were British children. And then, um, and the most common form of exploitation is forced labour and forced criminality, including county lines. So really keen to see you've got your youth leaders here that can really make a difference in the community. So how are children and people recruited? The most common methods are false job advertisements and online grooming of children. They are the most common methods of recruitment in the UK. Human trafficking is often hidden in plain sight. Contrary to popular belief, victims are not always physically restrained or kept in remote locations. Traffickers blend their activities into everyday environments, making it hard for bystanders to recognise the signs. Victims may be domestic workers, children being groomed online, or individuals promise false job opportunities abroad. And I know lately there's a campaign to find this young man, Charlie, who was last seen at Waterloo Station walking off with a man. We are seeing sponsored agency breaching their contracts, leaving migrant workers being stranded here in the UK without a promised job and not entitled to any government funding. But A21 is one of radical hope. We're not here to keep us in you know, the world of the darkness. We're here to bring a light. 
We really truly believe that slavery can be prevented, victims can be identified and assisted, and perpetrators can be brought to justice, and millions of survivors can step into a life of independence. Our holistic approach to abolishing modern day slavery is to reach, recover, and restore. Reach is through education and awareness that we can do to reduce the vulnerability. And I really do feel that's where God has called me uh, to act. Recover is by identifying and assisting victims of human trafficking, and restore is by supporting and empowering survivors to step into independence. So H21's solution is about what can we do? Well, I was reminded that Desmond Tutu said, there comes a point where we need to stop pulling people out of the river and go upstream and find out why they're falling in. So I ask you today, stay informed about human trafficking in your community. Share information with your friends, family and community. And I've got some leaflets and business sized cards that just carry with you. You never know when you may have that opportunity to share it with another. And also consider supporting H21's efforts to end modern day slavery through awareness and donating or joining our annual awareness event, The Walk for Freedom, is part of a global campaign happening across the whole world. And if here we are in Bournemouth, this will be our sixth walk on the 19th of October. We've heard incredible stories as a result of Walk for Freedom, and I, I caught up with Nikki today, and she was saying Rachel continues to host the Walk Up in Worcester, which for me is just absolutely amazing. I know she's in her final year, and if she can return back to Bournemouth, I can't wait, because I'll certainly be recruiting her to our team. But last year we actually had um, a survivor of human trafficking. She actually came from France to join us here in Bournemouth. She said to me, I was trafficked 30 years ago and it still haunts me now. But being part of this walk is healing. Also as a result of the walk, a report to Spain's um, helpline led to another person's safeguarding. So I don't think we can underestimate the impact that the walk actually has. No one can do everything. We love this quote from Christine Kane. And she says, no one person can do everything, but we can all do something. And together we can abolish slavery everywhere forever. Just before I sort of, um, well, after the video, I might give a bit more detail if I can, what the walk actually is, because um, where I presented before, people said, oh, I'm on Strava, you know, and I'm like, it's not that type of walk, it's, it's not a sponsored walk. But now we're going to watch a short video just showing the difference that awareness can make. Okay.
I have to go.
who it was originally written to, and why it was written. This gives us context. We all know that a text taken out of context becomes a pretext. Secondly, within that context, we must then look at the eternal truths that God has threaded through this passage to make it relevant to us today. We are a different culture, a very different culture, in a very different part of the world, and in a very different time, but with a God who Hebrews 13 tells us is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this passage, let's just come back to this moment, this passage was written to an audience who were in captivity. They were literally, we've been hearing about slavery this morning, they were literally enslaved. They were in captivity. An entire nation was in captivity in Babylon. And their nation had been conquered and they were under the ungodly rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. How can we possibly relate to that? How can we relate to an ungodly rule? <laughs> I'm not being political, I'm really not, I'm really not. How can we relate to that? You see, these people actually, when we break it down and we unpoliticize it, when we break it down, these people were struggling with three things. They were struggling with life. They were struggling with their identity, and they were struggling with their faith. And these are things that we can all struggle with today. Every single one of us. Life is hard. Life is difficult. We know that. We don't just see it on the news. We live it and we experience it. Our energy bills are going up. We, we worry about, are we putting the heating on? We, we have this rule in our house, the heating doesn't usually go on until the start of October. We've moved that to November. <laughs> We're not putting, we won't put it, I'm, I'm a big believer in cold wear a jumper. I love my daughter, she's one, she'll sit there in a t-shirt in the lounge. It's cold. Put a jumper on. Okay. Anyway, can anybody relate to that with their kids? Okay. So, we know that life is difficult. I'm not just talking about energy. Everything in life seems to be getting harder and harder, doesn't it? We struggle with our identity as Christians because we're always under scrutiny. We're pressured to conform to the identity that the world would impress upon us. Christianity is no longer accepted as a pillar of the community, so to speak. It's marginalized, it's pushed to one side. We are pushed to one side. We struggle with our identity in that way. And we struggle with our faith in God because often we don't exercise our faith in God. We say we, we have faith because we believe in God, but what about when we really come to the end of ourselves and we have nowhere to go? Where is our faith then? I didn't go off the platform then. But I didn't. It was an act of faith. <laughs> and some of these people, they begin to complain and moan against God as if it's his fault. When in fact it was their own idolatry. Idolatry is, is when we put anything other than God in a place of worship in our lives. And people can do that with all sorts of things, with, with sports, with relationships, with finances, anything, music, anything that we put into a place of worship, those things in and of themselves are not wrong, but when we put them in a place of worship, when we elevate those things in our lives into the place of God, then it becomes idolatry. And this had caused their idolatry, their literal idolatry, had caused God to remove his hand of protection and to allow them to come under his judgment. But God always, always had a plan to redeem his people and to bring them out of captivity. Amen? 
You see, sometimes God will allow us to go through darkness and captivity. Well, what happens when we do that? We do that because then we can see the light more clearly at the end. We can maybe appreciate the light more clearly at the end. Romans 8, 28 says, doesn't it? For we know that in all things, and Paul who wrote this, he went through some stuff, read up on it, shipwrecked twice, or was it three times? Spent a day and a night in the open sea. He was beaten, he was, he, he was imprisoned. He, all sorts of things happened to him. And he still wrote. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Somebody say amen. amen. This doesn't mean that God causes problems or captivity or difficulties, but it does mean that he will use them to teach us, to hone us, to sharpen us, to grow us. In a simplistic sense, you can liken it to a workout. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna invite Jonathan to come up. Where's John? Come on, Jonathan, come on. I need you. I've got, I've got a little uh, illustration for you this morning. Not often I use physical illustrations in church, but I've got a 20 kilo dumbbell here. <laughs> Since Jonathan's time. Actually, Thomas. Let's have a little competition. Come on, Thomas. There we go. So we've got a 20 kilo dumbbell here. I'm just proving that I can do it. So what we need to do is see how many reps each of these beefy lads can do. Okay? I'm just going to tighten these up so it doesn't come off and pull through the platform. Okay. Thanks, so, <laughs> They're problems. In case you haven't figured that out. Come on in, Thomas. Proper curls, not hammer curls. There we go. Four, count off. Five, six, seven. Are you moving your shoulders? Eight. Great class. But what we do is we put 
that muscle is under tension and resistance. And the muscle fibre is torn. And the muscle fibre fills with blood, which brings proteins to the muscle, which not only heal it, but they bring it back bigger and stronger. When we're put under tension, when we're put under resistance in life, when we are torn in life, and we allow ourselves to come under the blood of Jesus, we come back bigger and stronger in Him. Amen? Amen. And so God's people here, they're in a season of captivity. They're living under that tension, that resistance. The weight of their captivity is upon them, and it is a lot bigger than 20 kilos. But the problem is, they're blaming God rather than looking to God. And how often do we do this? God, you know, you've done it. Why have you? Why have you? Why have you? And God is saying to us, maybe, why have you? <laughs> So these people are complaining to God. What's his response? Verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? Jacob and Israel. The first thing that God does when his people are in the midst of trouble is to remind them of their identity. If you know your Old Testament, you'll know that Jacob and Israel are the same person. Jacob was the, the brother of Esau. And his name was changed to Israel by God in Genesis 32 after he wrestled <coughs> with God. I'm sure most of us are familiar in some way with that story. Genesis 32, 28 says, The man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. That's what the name means. It means wrestled with God and overcome. That's what Israel means wrestled with God and have overcome that, that doesn't mean that he beat God in a wrestling match it means that he came through the other side of it he was still breathing but he came through the other side of it recognizing the blessing of God through that struggle I have wrestled with God and I have wrestled with men and have, and have come through it and I see God might be a better way to understand it. Israel then became the father of a nation, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the promises of God came into physical reality through him because he recognized his identity through the struggle. So by calling them old Jacob and old Israel and Isaiah, the two names of the patriarch, the father of the nation, God was reminding his people of their identity in him. He was reminding them who they were, where they had come from. And he was reminding them of where they were headed, where they were going. This made up their identity. Israel is your father. You are a people birthed in struggle, but recognize my hand of blessing through that. We need to recognize that we are a people of God. Recognize our birthright in Him. Because when we're confident in our identity, then we can be confident in our authority. We need to be reminded of that. And often reminded of who we are in God. Reminded of our identity and reminded of our authority in Him. Romans 8, 14, 17 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought out your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we're children, we're heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. Amen. You will suffer in life. We 
kind of peddle a Christianity to people through rose-colored glasses, telling them that if they believe in Jesus, all of their troubles will be over. Because the Bible doesn't tell us that. Quite the opposite, actually. Life is tough, and our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking to devour us. But our God is good. Our God is bigger than the lion. The lion of Judah is bigger than the lion of this world. Amen? You are bigger. You are a child of God. Take hold of your identity and your authority in Him. You are a co-heir with Christ today. That's your identity. What does the this song say? No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. We need to start believing it. We need to start taking hold of it, not just on a Sunday, but every day. We can struggle with God. He understands that. We can struggle with people. He understands that. But when we start to live in victory, when we start to recognize the hand of blessing through the struggle, and as his promises start to take physical form in our lives, then we will come into a new expectation in God. Good exercise. When you go through it, when you go through stuff of life, look at yourself in the mirror, not just in the reflection. But really see yourself. And say out, out loud, declare out loud. Maybe not when there's other people around, you know, but just you don't want to get cast off. <laughs> <laughs> but just do it. Look at yourself in the mirror. I'm not a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I am a co heir with Christ. Verse 28, let's move on. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? So God reminds the people of, his, of their identity in him. And the next thing he does is remind them of his identity to them. He reminds them of who he is. Listen, guys, he said, this is who you are. <laughs> Remember that. And now this is who I am. This is is my name. When I was a, a kid, I remember being in um, uh, St. Clement's, uh, not primary school, infant school, when we first moved to Bournemouth. And, uh, they're, they're, you know, kids get into these conversations. My dad does this, my dad does that, my dad's a, a policeman, now my dad's a soldier and he's got a gun. And, and uh, I sort of kept a bit quiet. I'm not going to great detail, but you know, I didn't have a lot to compare to. And so what I used to do was, was either avoid those conversations or make up some grandiose sort of fabrication. My dad's a spaceman or he's a secret agent or something like that. We don't need to do that with God. We don't need to embellish who he is because he is who he says he is. And I know for absolutely sure that my dad's bigger than everyone's dad. In Exodus 3, he says those words, I am who I am. How confident is that? How much assurance can you draw from that? I can give you some nice illustrations to communicate to you who God is, but my words, they, they can't express the fullness of his majesty. My vocabulary cannot adequately convey to you just how big God is. Our language falls short when we try to fathom his awesomeness. All we can do is turn to scripture, open our eyes, open our hearts and our minds to get a glimpse of the breathtaking glory and power of God through the eyes of His Spirit at work within us. You know you have God within you through His Holy Spirit. As 
So when you read about who God is in Scripture, it, it quickens something in you. It brings, it brings the words to life. This is true worship. This is worshiping in spirit and truth. It's putting ourselves into the right perspective in, in the light of his radiance. We just read some words to you about who God is from Revelation 4. Not preaching on Revelation, I just like the way it describes God. After this, I looked and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit. And behold, the throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne there was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns upon their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, there are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. And the first living creature was like an, a lion, and the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Wow. This is who God is. And this God wants to know you. Let's move on, verse 29. He gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. We've just seen that. <laughs> <laughs> Young men stumble and fall. Thankfully they didn't. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. Once we recognize our identity and our authority in Christ, and once we recognize who He is, and then he reveals his promises to us. He tells us exactly what he's going to do. Because he wants us, why, why, why does he start by, by telling us that? Why does he say, listen, this is what I'm going to do, and then talk about who you are? Why, why, why is that the last thing? Because he wants us to love him for who he is before we love him for what he does. I like to give my kids nice things, but hopefully they love me because of the relationship, not because of what I give them. Any parent can understand that, I think, but God loves to give good gifts to his children. Have you ever felt weak or weary? This is where God's people were in captivity in Babylon. This is where we can be in our lives, when things seem beyond control. But when things seem beyond control, they're never beyond his control. When you're at your weakest, like that muscle which is torn and shredded, then the blood of Christ will restore you. The Holy Spirit will fill you. And you will come back stronger. You will be raised by him, standing as a soldier of Christ in the armor of God. Even youths grow tired and weary, young men will stumble and fall. Human strength has its limitations, doesn't it? When we're young, we, we feel invincible. Life will go on forever. We think that we can do anything, fight any fight, win any race. But even human endurance has boundaries. And if young men can grow tired and weary, what happens when we, when we're not so young? 
I know that there are some people here today who feel that they may be at the limit of their endurance. I don't know how much more I can take. I'm not asking you to put your hands up, but you ever felt like that? That you stand in front of the wall, there's, there's nothing left. Nothing left to be taken. You don't know how you're going to get up the next hill. I don't know how much more I can take. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come to me. All who are weary and heavy burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm gentle and lonely in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Recognize that it's the Lord who renews our strength today. It's not a strength that comes from ourselves. In fact, we've got to come to the end of our own strength to put our hope in Him, to wait upon Him, another version says. Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, turn away from evil, it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, your vats will be bursting with wine. Great juice, not alcohol. Trust Him. Wait upon Him. Come to the end of your own strength, come to the end of your own understanding. Come to your own, to the end of your own way of figuring things out. Step out of the home. Trust him that he's not going to let you down. What happens then is we, we, we enter into this new phase of our relationship where we step off the edge. But you're not going to fall. You're going to soar on wings of eagles. You stand. We're going to see him again in a moment. And we're just going to be uh, offering baskets here in the front. If you have brought an offering this morning, then please do just, as, as we sing, just feel free to come out, place your offering in the basket there. But I want to pray for you. If you need to be reminded of your identity in Christ, then I want to pray for you today. I'm just going to get the music just to play very quietly. If you need to be reminded of his identity, just how amazing he is, then I want to pray for you today. If you need to be reminded of his power in a demonstrable action in your life, then I want to pray for you today. Let's just bow our heads. I don't often do this. But if you need to be reminded, could you all just humor me and close your eyes for a moment? I want to make this easy for people to respond today. If you need to be reminded of your identity, of your identity, of your authority in Christ, would you just, just indicate, just show me a hand today so that I can pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Put your hands down. If you need to be reminded today of his identity and just how powerful and incredible he is, and just show me a hand today. Thank you. Your yeah, hands down. Thank you. And if you need to be reminded of his power and to see that actually working in your life, then again, show me a hand today. Put your hands down, folks. Thank you. You can open your eyes. I just, just wanted to make that a bit easier for people to be sensitive to the moving of the Spirit in people's hearts. Father, today as we worship you, we thank you for who you are. But Lord, we thank you for who we are in you. And Lord, I pray for every person who's lifted up a hand today to say that they need to be reminded of their authority. Lord, I pray that every person who put up a hand today will know that you are the living God.
that you are who you say you are. And that Lord, you make us who your word tells us you we are. Sons, daughters of the living God, co-heirs with Christ. Lord, may we be so aware of our authority in you. That Lord, we can take authority over situations, over struggles, over the things of this world. And Lord, maybe we also, for those who put up their hands to say they need to be reminded of your identity, may we know that I am is God. That you are the everlasting, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things. That you are the God who threw stars into space, who formed the world, who breathed breath into our lungs. Lord, may we, may, may we come to a place of worship in you because of who you are, not just because of what we can gain from you. And Lord, if we need to be reminded today of your power at work in our lives, Lord, I, I pray over all of us today, whether we put a hand up or not, that each one of us may know your power at work in our lives. May know your power in the authority that we take over things in your name. May know your power in a miraculous way to break down strongholds, to free captives. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm just going to come to worship now again. If you. If you brought an offering, just bring it out this morning. Uh, if you're a guest or a visitor, please don't feel under any uh, obligation at all this morning. We just want to worship you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank
for who we are in you. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you for what you do. Lord, may we take that with us through this week. And Lord, again, we thank you for all of this provision here today. We ask, Lord, that you will bless it to every, to every person, every family, every child, every man, every woman that receives from this. Lord, it's a drop in the bucket. But we know that you're the God who multiplies. And so, Lord, we give it to you with open hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. All of our usual week stuff is um, on the website, springhill.org, or is on our social media by searching me at um, And, of course, there is the church email that goes out every Tuesday. Bless you.